How's everybody today? Yeah. Don't sound too good. Yeah. We're gonna have to really knock it out of the park in order to get that crowd up. Amen. <laughs> Amen. God is so good, church. I mean, just seeing you here is a blessing, and it's it's an honor to be able to express the Word of God to the body of Christ. Can you imagine that? That you are the bride. I know it's kind of hard for men sometimes to understand that form and shape, but being the bride means that uh, you're uh, connected to the groom. And that groom being Jesus Christ means that we have favor, we have destiny, and we have inheritance. You are inheriting everything that Jesus has. So that in itself, church, is just, uh, it's amazing. I can never get over the fact that God works the way he does it. He works in miracles. It's a mind-boggling thing to me that he works through prophetic that he works through all of these gifts that he's given us. And of course, what I said last week was that in you, you're a great blessing. And you are walking with this household of goods that he has deemed for you to have. And not all of us operate in these gifts uh, the way we may want to or a kind of uh, are shy or afraid to, but they're there. They're there for the for the usage of Christ to be able to be expressed through you. Amen? Amen. So that's who you are. I want to talk again, as I am this month, about reassurance, but the reassurance that I really want to lay out on your heart is family matters. You know, there used to be a, a program on TV it was called Family Matters. I don't know much about it. To be honest with you, I didn't research it. But I do know that the word itself, Family Matters, is true. Amen. How many of you love your family? Amen. How many of you get mad at your family? Amen. Everybody's hand should go up with that one. Amen. And yet, you're mad at your family but if someone comes in and messes with your family, what's your response? You're protective, right? That's the way family is. They're, they become protective when they see that. But nonetheless, family counts. Well, the enemy, he's trying to uh, mess it up. He's trying to redirect it. He's trying to break it up. He's doing everything he can. Over the, the period of time that I've been born uh, alive and uh, all the way up to, to now, when I was uh, brought into the world, that's when it seemed that the enemy really made a movement to uh, bring family to a disarray. In the 50s, that's when uh, all of these things began to birth. Uh, the music began to take us in a different direction. The visuals began to change things. The verbiage, verbal, began to change. And now we're at today's place where it's, we're in a total wreck. The, the, the enemy is trying to stop family. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 29 with me this morning, if you would. But as you're turning there, I want you to know that uh, today's family, the enemy is trying to erode the society we live in. Okay, now when you think about that, what kind of a society do we live in? What they call a modern age or nuclear society. The nuclear family is, has been birthed. Uh, the, the millennial 
is kind of like the, there was the X and then the millennial, and now there's this uh, mean millennial, I think is what it's called, which is probably 20 and under, maybe even less than that, into the teens. That particular family has really been uh, eroded. The enemy has come in, he's planted seed, and do you know that the, the devil's a farmer? The devil likes to farm, and he likes to, pl to plant, he likes to water, and he likes to see weeds increase. So his objective is to come into our lives, into our society, and plant seed that's going to misdirect or redirect or cause us to be incorrect. When it comes to God, his purpose for family and who we've become. So with that, what the enemy wants to do is destroy our moral compass. You know what morality is? It's simply the good and the bad. He wants us to walk more in the bad. He's changed the color of bad to white. From black, which was bad, he's changed it to white. We now see the white as bad and the black as good. When I was a kid growing up, uh, they used to have a lot of Western uh, movies and television, what have you. Well, with that Western, they had the guy that was bad and he had a black hat. Well, as the years went on, they began to make that guy a good guy. They just seeded a little here and a little there caused us to begin to believe the bad is good. It's like when you we are now living in society and you walk down the street and uh, people see you and you're a tough looking person, they say, man, you're bad. And that's a good thing. That means that you carry this aura of fear that emits from you and causes people to fear you. And what do they say? They say that they respect you. And you're bad. Evil. And you're respected because you're evil? Twisted, church. We are twisted anymore. Now, in the nuclear family, which is the mean millennial, and also into uh, going into some of these other stages, in this nuclear family, they've changed gender. Now they have come in and they begin to cause us to change our thoughts of gender. What gender really is. A male, female, etc. Well, I uh, was listening to a program the other day and they had made the statement that they are trying to get when a child is born, they want the birth certificate to say human. Now with that, the reason they want the birth certificate to say human is because they want the persons to begin to, when that child is born and grows, they choose their gender. Nuts, church. This is absolutely crazy. And that's what's happened to us today. Now, I know that a lot of us, we have family that are uh, of that uh, uh, notion. A lot of us have people that surround us that are friends, relatives, that have that belief that they can choose their gender and the gender isn't what they were born with. The gender is what they choose, okay? So that's how out of whack we've become. So the enemy seeded that years ago in how to change our thought life. Now, I'm not against people. My objective and my job is to love. My objective and my job isn't to judge, but to guide, direct, and build. That's my objective as a, as a man of God, as the shepherd. But I also have to be true, true to this. Yes, yes. This is where I must be true. 
So along with all of this, church, uh, I just want you to see that what the enemy has desired to do is he did that in the garden. He began his process in the garden. How did he do that? Through Adam and Eve, where he caused them to change their uh, alignment from being aligned with God to being aligned with self. It, it really wasn't to align with just the devil, the serpent. It was to be aligned with self because they made this decision for themselves. Adam stepped in and uh, uh, went into the sin with Eve. Uh, some say it was because he was protecting her and understood what was going to take place. And if he didn't subject himself to that sin as well, then Eve would be alone in it. And man would be completely separated. But because they were connected, they say that he stepped in with her. He chose for self and for Eve instead of aligning himself with God. So now that you've gotten a, a little bit of mindset and perspective of what I want to preach about today, I want you to look at Genesis chapter 29. I'm going to start in the first verse, and I'm going to make a couple of jumps, but just bear with me. So Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. And he looked and saw a well in the field. And behold, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of uh, that well they watered the flocks. A large stone was on the well's mouth. Now all the flocks would be gathered there, and they would roll the stone from the well's mouth, water the sheep, put the stone back in its place on the well's mouth. And Jacob said to them, My brethren, where are you from? And they said, We are from Haran. Then he said to them, Do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. So he said to them, Is he well? And they uh, said, He is well. And look, his daughter Rachel is coming with the sheep. Then he said, Look, it is high day. It is not time for the cattle to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go and feed them. But they said, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered together and they have rolled the stone from the well's mouth, then we water the sheep. Now while he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near, rolled the stone from the well's mouth, and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Now, first off, there's order, okay? And mankind is uh, to be associated with order. We should live in order. We should uh, operate in an orderly fashion. It's like right now we're in uh, uh, the Black Friday move and mood of the people. And Black Friday generally comes, a lot of people will come in and they will get uh, all of their bargains. But along with that comes a lot of disorder. People actually box each other. I've, I've seen women box, I mean like men, over a Nintendo or whatever it may be. But they get in there and, and it's just a bunch of disorder. Well, God's purpose isn't like that. God says, okay, this is my order. This is how you're to worship me. This is how you're to serve me. And this is how you're to serve one another. So with that, uh, Jacob, he has come. He's ran away from his father's house. He's running from his brother. And he wants to come to his uncle's house now, who's Laban. His cousin, Rachel, is there, and she's a beautiful woman. He decides that he's going to give her first uh, of uh, being able to get the sheep. So he immediately goes into out of order. Previous to that, he ripped his brother off. 
out of order. He uh, uh, ripped his birthright off out of order. Jacob was a thief. Jacob was a liar. He was a cheat. And uh, he operated in, a, in an illegal fashion. That's what the devil likes. He wants us to be illegal. And in regard to the way the family uh, nucleus is, illegal. We have lost our, our way and now are going down the wrong path in the wrong way. So verse 11 says, Then Jacob kissed Rachel, lifted up his voice, and wept. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's relative and that he was Rebekah's son. So she ran and told her father. Then it came to pass, when Laban heard the report about Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him, embraced him, kissed him, brought him into his house. So he told Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, Surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him for a month. So now everything is, is uh, coming to a place where, just like us, when we have family come in from out of town, you're really excited about seeing them. They're there for a day. And you're talking about old old times you're spending time with one another and as time goes on you notice that they squeeze the toothpaste wrong <laughs> then you realize that they like stinky food and uh, I'm talking about you know they'll put a lot of uh, ingredients in their food when they cook and it makes the house sm uh, smell kind of like uh, initially when my wife first started making menudo it did not smell good. And uh, have you ever had chitlins? Uh -huh. Chitlins do not smell good. Oh. Tasty, but not smell good. So what she learned through the years, how to dissipate that smell. So she started putting stuff in that made it change the odor. Well, she gained some order by doing that and pleased all of us through it. So this is the same mindset that here we've got Jacob, he comes in, he's spending time with his uncle for a month, and as that time goes on, the uncle begins to realize that Jacob's a ripoff. He listens to him, I'm sure that through the conversation, he began to hear and learn that Jacob was a thief, he was what they call an usurper. That's where someone would come in and take over from underneath. It was a, like a Jezebel action. And so this is kind of the way he lived. So uncle was a ripoff too. It ran in the family genes, even though they wore skirts. And verse 15 says, Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what should your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah. The name of the other younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were delicate, but Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. Now Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to another man. Stay with me. So here he makes a deal. He says seven years, and at the end of that, her and I are going to get married. Is that okay with you, uncle? And he said, fine. So they set it up, and it goes, so, so uh, then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go into her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. And it came to pass in the evening, he took Leah's daughter, brought her to Jacob, and he went into her, and Laban gave his maid, Zil, uh, Zilpha, to his daughter Leah as a maid. So it came to pass in the morning, and behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? What is, what it not, was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? And Laban said, it must not be done so in our country to give the younger before the first. Fulfill her, for, fulfill her week 
and we will give you this one also for the service which you will serve with me still another seven years. So then what the uncle says is, look, you go ahead and uh, you, you've already had Leah. You already went uh, and uh, had relations with her. Now, in order for you to get my other daughter, you need to work an extra week, just seven days. Then I'll give her to you and you commit another seven years to me. So they're ripping each other off. Uh, and as you see in his life, he begins to just uh, basically steal from his uncle. And things begin to change. The nucleus of the family begins to grow. And uh, people in the family begin to operate in uh, an, uh, basically an illegal fashion. But in the end, church, what happens is now Jacob has gained his identity. Now, if you have an identity, church, it rests in your heritage. Who have you received your heritage from? And in that heritage, there's all kinds of things that occur. That heritage, you can get out of that heritage anger. You can get jealousy out of it. You can uh, be greed, greedy out of that heritage. You can be vengeful. Uh, you can be unforgiving. You can be a bad communicator. You can uh, uh, be an arguing person. Uh, you can be unforgiving. You could live, uh, come through a, a family that's been divorced. Uh, addictions. You can be inconsistent. And you can be one that steps out of your boundaries. All these things can come about if you make the decision that you're going to get back. This is about me. We, when we're younger, many times are selfish. Not always, not every person. It's like I'm thinking about uh, Tony and uh, Jessica's son. His name is Neil. Uh, Neil, when he gets money, he goes and he buys stuff for everybody. All of his sisters and his mom and dad. And sometimes doesn't even get anything for himself. And he's done this as a little boy up to now that he's a preteen. And so he's unselfish. So that's a natural order that's in him. But there are other people that are selfish. And they grow up thinking about how they're going to get for themselves. I think about my life. Uh, growing up, I was pretty much a giving kind of person until I got to a certain age, and then I began to become selfish. And I learned that because I found out that if I didn't get what I needed to get for myself, no one else was gonna get it for me. As a little boy, uh, we would go and work on the farm, and uh, working on the farm, we would uh, get paid, and with that money, we would save it, and at the end of, uh, of the, those days, at the time of harvest, we'd have all of our money, and stores would go, uh, their, their goods would be on sale, and you'd go buy your school clothes. And that's the way I lived my life as a little boy, and I thought nothing of it, but as I grew, I began to just do for me. I did it through my teen years. Everything was about me. I remember one time when uh, uh, it was Thanksgiving. And just because I wanted to, and my other friends did it, we all ran away. The day before Thanksgiving, we ran away. I mean, it was, I was not thinking and I wasn't caring about my family. I only focused on what I felt like doing. Selfish. Well, uh, that happens sometimes because of our family or sometimes because of situations we run into. But we begin to live in a family of disorder. The devil likes that. He wanted to be, me to be that way. But yet, when I was that age, as a teenager, 
I did know I had destiny. Everybody in their life, somehow, they may miss it, but somehow it's spoken to you of your destiny. You have destiny, church. Amen. But what we do is we stay out of order and never capture that destiny or never hear God tell us what our destiny is. And we lose the path that God wants us on. What we need to do is begin to understand it's not your uh, uh, divorced father and mother's fault. My mom and dad, they divorced when I was three months old. At the, month, the age of three months, my dad left my mom. Now, there could have been reasons for that. I don't know. Could have uh, been a lot of things. But you know who uh, I blamed it on? Me. I don't know if you understand that or not, but if your parents have ever divorced or if you've been in divorces, a lot of times you can blame you or you can blame someone else. And what that does, it takes you right out of the order of God. God wants us to have that family order that he designed when he initially uh, made Adam and Eve. So with this, as, as we begin to change our mindset, as my parents divorced, what was my objective in life? It wasn't that, shoot, I'll divorce now. I turned just the opposite. I said, if I ever marry, I'll never divorce. I'll be married to that person the rest of my life. So I never married. I said, I'll live with women. I'll get my cake and eat it too. I don't know if any of you guys are like that or not, or even you women are like that or not. But I do know that that had to be that indwelling selfishness that I walked in. So as time went on, I met my Josie, I'll call her. We are married. <laughs> And we went back and forth, and she finally tricked me into marrying her. <laughs> she, I mean, it took a lot, but she, she just tricked me. And so we ended up getting married. And I told her, man, I wish I was you. And she looked at me and said, why? So I can have me. <laughs> you get it? <laughs> guys are slow this morning. <laughs> so through that, you know, that was my, my whole way of life. It was all about me. And uh, then I, there's all kinds of mean and evil things I did to my wife. After we got, I was just a mean guy. I was a horrible person. And until Jesus Christ came into my life. Amen. When Jesus came in, it changed my entire family order just overnight. I'm not kidding you. It was an overnight action yes. where my entire family order transformed. Yes. And you know why? Because I stopped thinking once Jesus came into my heart, my mindset turned to him. And then through having him as my top order, my top deal, my number one thought in my life, it made me begin to become a man of order. Yes. And I saw my wife, I saw my sons, I saw my life, I saw my family in a whole different light. Yes, I turned upside down, I flipped. And everybody was astounded by the transformation. It was literally a miracle. Went home, got rid of every drug, every a bag of weed, every pill, every needle, every bottle, every can, everything. I went into the house, and it was almost as though I was possessed with Jesus. And it was anything that Jesus didn't want or didn't like in me, I got rid of. 
And I didn't do it any longer for me. I did it for him. And my wife and I just became this new family of order. I began to honor her, respect her, love her, treat her as mine and mine alone. And she treated me in the same fashion. And we began to be in agreement and we began to listen to each other, do what we knew we needed to do. She gave up on her part. She said, God, whatever you have for my husband, whatever you want to do in his life, I give him to you to do. And I will submit myself to that because of you. So my wife changed her mindset in order and became totally submitted to me because of him. Yeah. See, she didn't do it because of me, because I was a rotten apple <laughs> until I met Jesus, but she did it because of him, because she found a new love and one that she could trust beyond me. And it just changed everything. We changed the way we treated our children. We changed the way we ate. We changed the way we lived. We even as the years went on, he even got rid of our televisions. Right. It changed our whole makeup of life. And guess what? When you go home and you don't have a TV or cable, and you don't have videos or whatever it is we got now, you don't have uh, personal computers, etc. we had each other. Amen. And so we had to give our time to each other. So my heartbeat began to twist and turn and I began to give every night I would pray with my sons. Didn't matter. Every night I would pray with them and I would read to them. Through the years I read them books this big and, and I would ask them questions at the end of uh, the one, two, three chapters that I would read. And I was building my sons and I would speak into my sons and I'd tell them who they are, what they're called to be. I would tell them how important they are and how valuable they are to God, to the kingdom and to each other. And I just embedded that in their spirit, church. That is how the nucleus began to transform. Oh, but don't kid yourself. I, I never did kid myself. There's still an enemy out there, and he wants to mess up my nucleus. And he tried for I don't know how many years. You remember, Joe, so many years uh, we wrestled with our kids. Once they went into public school, they turned into uh, uh, just dark individuals they begin to walk in this realm of sin. And for, for many, many years, it was actually when I started the church, so that's have to be about 24 years, that uh, they walked, not 24, uh, about 14 years, they walked in this darkness after I started the church. And uh, so I'm not kidding myself, don't you kid yourself, you need to pray for your kids but stay diligent with those kids. Do, do not give up on them. This family nucleus is growing and it's going to grow by how much you love and serve God. That's key. Beyond everything, you must serve God. I know maybe your children are out there, they're a mess. Maybe your parents are out there, whatever. Maybe uh, uh, whatever it may be that is in your eyes, almost hopeless, don't give up. I prayed for my family for 30 plus years and never gave up. And that's how you have to see it. Do not give up. They will open their hearts and change. So as we see this, the, our identity uh, in, in our family and also our friends can really change if we don't stay focused. And the example I want to give you today is the example of a man named Judas. Now, your identity, church, begins when you marry. 
If you're single, don't give up on, on being married. Marriage is important, even if you're single. If you're single, it is a value, and you can build a good relationship. If you're single and don't want to get married and don't get married, that's okay. I, I'm not here to try and convince you. I'm just here to guide you. And so in that, in Genesis 2.24, before I go into uh, uh, John chapter 14, but in uh, Genesis 2.24, uh, the Bible says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Matthew 26, rather, I'm sorry. So the Bible's telling us that there needs to be a one flesh mindset. Amen. Okay, one flesh. And flesh means that you're going to walk in the order of the earth, but it's going to be in the values of Christ. Okay, one flesh means that we have to live on this earth, we have to function, we, we must eat, we must work, we must have finances, etc. So that's a, that's a for sure thing. But as we go further on, we need to know that you have to have a compass. See, what a compass simply is, is it's an item that has north, south, east, and west on it with a, a metal uh, uh, unit on the top. And what that compass does is it always pulls to the north. And the reason it pulls to the north is because the north has a magnetic field. With that compass, it should always uh, have a bearing of north on it, no matter where you're at. But there are times that when you get into what is called a magnetic field, and what that does is that's a field that has a lot of ore, that's where we make our, get our magnets from, then the, the compass will go wacky. And it won't know where north, true north really is. You must know that Jesus Christ is your true north. Amen. And to understand this in a, in a spiritual way, when you look up into the stars, and you uh, are on a clear night, and there's not a lot of lights around you, as you look up, you'll see in the northern part of uh, uh, the celestials, you'll see a black open area. And that open area is where I believe heaven is. I believe it's there. I believe God's throne is there. And it's just a, a massive uh, space that's open and you don't see the planets like you do the rest of uh, uh, the celestial. So with that, Jesus sits in the northern celestial. The uh, magnetic pool is to the north. Jesus is your north uh, bound compass. You must always be guiding your life, always be guiding everything you do to the north. Anytime something good happens in my life, I give praise to the North King, Jesus. I give him glory all the time. I'll say, man, thank you, Lord. Or I'll see something, miracle happen. I say, oh, thank you, God. I know it was you. You're involved. So every good thing, I give praise and glory to God. That needs to be a part of your new uh, found order and compass. So through this, as we begin to see this, uh, this new mindset and identity that we have to go with, I want you to look at uh, Matthew chapter 26, if you would. As we turn there, in Matthew, of course, uh, this is the first Bible of the first uh, letter of the Gospels. And Matthew, he was one of the apostles. He wrote this. Mark and Luke uh, were not apostles, but uh, John was, so the four Gospels. Matthew, on the other hand, very powerful writer, and he wrote some astounding things. And uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, I want you to follow with me this morning. Matthew 26, 
verse 1. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these uh, uh, sayings that he said to his disciples, you know that after two days is the Passover and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Now, Jesus gives them the first hint and the first directive that, hey, I'm going to be crucified. So he had been previously telling the disciples this, that eventually he was going to die and uh, he wasn't going to be on the earth anymore. And the disciples kind of didn't understand and ignored and were blinded by the Holy Ghost that they couldn't understand because they may have done some things that would have knocked the order that God wanted to operate in this whole scenario for Christ to die so that we would be saved. So through this, as we see what's going on, Judas is involved in this picture here. Judas hears, oh, he's going to die. So once he hears that, he begins to get reassured that somehow Jesus is going to die and he has a plan working inside of his spirit, inside of his mind by listening to the wrong compass. He's in this demonic magnetic field that is just causing him to turn the ways that he doesn't need to turn. And Judas, by the way, he is the one that keeps the money. He's the money handler. Money really worked well in the hands of Judas. Judas was smart with finances. Judas knew how to get food for everybody. Judas knew how to get money. So he was the money man. Money, a lot of times, can cause this magnetic deception. It can make us make decisions that are not for God, but for self. We many times make monetary decisions that really mess us up, cause us to uh, make uh, things happen or do things that just cause us to be in a disarray. And we regret it when the bill comes in and we got to pay it. I don't know if you've ever bought things that were just crazy. I know uh, uh, my sons, uh, uh, Isaac uh, Mochizuki as well, they would go out and buy things and they'd come back and they'd get ripped off. You know, it was like, that's not worth what you paid for it. And then as time went on, they began to learn and they began to come back with great deals. But that's not the point. The point is, is that this Money compass causes us to make choice that is improper. So as we look at John chapter 14, verse 6, it is in your bulletin, by the way, if you don't want to go there in the Bible. It says this, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to me, uh, to the Father except through me. So Jesus is, what he's doing is he's implying that he's the way, the truth, and the life. So you need to know that that compass, true north, is truth. When Jesus said that he was going to die, that was truth. Judas understood that. He took it for its value, and he knew that when Jesus spoke, it was truth. He knew that Jesus, whatever he said, it was going to happen. So in the compass workings of Judas, he was in this wrong magnetic uh, uh, field that uh, redirected him, and he started listening to the wrong voices. You have to open your ears to the right voice. Amen. Betrayal, church, is uh, an, an action. It's a magnetic pull that the devil likes to put on us to cause us to make improper decisions. We can betray in small things and large things, but we must be careful of these actions of betrayal that sit in our spirit. Let's look a little further. I want to follow along from verse 3 to 8. 
and says this, Then the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of uh, the high priest who was called Caiaphas and plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. But they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. And when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask a very costly fragrant oil. And she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, why this waste? This is the second thing. Here Judas now has been triggered into understanding that Money had been thrown away in his eyes. It had been wasted. It was improper and completely out of his order. Many times we get selfish and are unwilling to give. And what happens is it's out of our order and not God's. Amen. One example, when uh, I was just the other day, my wife, we were always giving funds away. We're always helping families. We're always helping people. People that don't go to our church. People that are out there in the streets. People, just all sorts of individuals. People that are homeless, etc. Always giving things. Even in the street corners. Giving, giving, giving. Well, there's a, 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 an individual or family. I can't even remember the specifics. But it had to do with giving more money. And I got kind of frustrated. I didn't reflect this or tell my wife. But internally, I started to wrestle with the giving. You ever done that? You ever get just flat out tired of giving? Like this church, we don't pull on people to give. We just don't do that. It's just not in my nature. We trust God that he's going to work on you to give. That you're going to take care of those things when you feel God needs you to. Nonetheless, with that, I got a check in my spirit. As I began to sour on giving, what occurred is God began to work on me. I said, son, this isn't your money. It's not about you. I pulled back. I reevaluated. I got out of that magnetic field that the devil would put me in. And I got on the true north compass. Amen. And when I did that, all I did was get back into order. Church, we can give and give and give and never outgive God. And it doesn't even have to be giving to the church. It could be giving to mankind, no matter what. God always has his way of striking you and convincing you. But it's up to you to be able to hear that movement of the compass to know if you're true north or in a magnetic field of the devil. And there's where you have to learn who vo whose voice it is you're listening to. So as we look at this, this is the second instance of Judas now beginning to understand, hmm, Number one, Jesus said that he is going to go to the cross. He said he was going to die. Number two, this woman has anointed his body. But deeper than that, Judas got ticked off because they used this possibility of money, this possibility of this oil. It was a year's wage of oil that was in that ointment and he got ticked him and he started to influence the others that were around him because if you notice it doesn't just say him it says they so the disciples got in an uproar and they saw this woman they're freaked out she's got this alabaster and she breaks it breaks it over the head of Jesus and it pours all over his body and it saturates inside of him. 
And Jesus tells them some things after that occurs. So let's go a little further. As we see what Judas has done and uh, him being indignant about the waste of this uh, perfume, in 1 Timothy 6.10 it says, For the love of money is the root of all evil. It says all kinds of evil for, the, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Greed simply is sorrowful. Greed becomes a weight. Greed becomes a regret. Greed is sorrowful, church. And you must begin to see it for what it really is. Greed is not healthy and it is not smart. So let's go further in the, the scriptures. Go to verse uh, 8 again. And it says, but when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, why this waste? Verse 9. For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. Now, I believe this is Judas speaking, and he's saying that he could take care of the poor. Well, in the scriptures, it says that what this guy was doing is he was ripping money out of the, the money bag that went to Jesus and the disciples. Now, think about this. If Judas was actually ripping the money off and Jesus is alive and in the same group with him? How deep has his compass got messed up? He, he just walks in a field that is an ore of magnetic pull that's pulling him towards the enemy's camp. He has actually been stealing money from the money back box. That is mind-boggling to me. Church, many times we think and we say, you know what? I wouldn't have done it that way if Jesus was in front of me. If Jesus was with me, I wouldn't this. If Jesus was actually there, I wouldn't that. And we will. We, we, we would say things that we say would never happen. Peter did. Peter said, I'll never deny you, Jesus. I'm with you, bro. Me and you, homie. We run together and we die together. That's how our mindset is. Jesus turned when he heard. Peter tried to pull Jesus to the magnetic field. And Jesus felt that magnetic pull. And he turned and he looked at Peter. When T Peter said, you're not going to die. We're going to protect you, homie. I got the sword, baby. I'll take care of anybody that comes near you. You know what Jesus told Peter? He said, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense to me. Get out of that magnetic field, Peter, and get back on the true north. That's where he lost his whole directive and messed it up. And it all came to pass, too. So as we see this going on, here we've got all of these protests. All these guys are ticked off. And then they said that all this money should, could have been given to the poor. Yeah, right. You could have had steak instead of fish. That's what you're thinking about, Mr. Disciple. And it says in verse 10, But when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. Many times, church, the simple things, the things that to us are not as significant, are extremely significant to God. Amen. When you give somebody money on the corner, you may think, you know, I just feel bad for them. But no, that's a deed well done. I don't care, church. Even these guys that say, hey, I'll be honest, I'm going to buy a beer. I've seen those signs. Right. Yeah. You know, it's like, that's not between, uh, this is between me and God and you. 
And I want you to know that Jesus loves you, man. And I pray you get out of this mess. And give him money and go on. Let the Holy Ghost, the seed you just seeded him with, oh, trust me, somehow, some way, God's going to go. And he's going to bring the movement of the Holy Ghost and his spirit drawing closer to God. Maybe two steps, maybe ten. Or maybe right to God. But it's not up to us. Our job is to be a good Christian. So we go further in verse 11. For you have the poor with you always. But me, you do not have always. There goes another trigger. Judas is in the group, church. He's thinking, ah, he's not going to be around. He said he's not going to be around. He said he was going to the cross. He said that she did this for his burial. He said that he wasn't going to be here much. For in pouring his, this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Then comes the hit, church. And as we look at the scriptures and begin to see that uh, this reassurance of death comes to the heart of Judas. Judas picks it up. Judas is in that wrong magnetic field. Judas isn't on the true north compass. All that going on in Matthew 26, 14 through 16, the scriptures say this. Then one of the 12 called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests and said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. So from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. Now in that statement, they said that they were going to give him 30 pieces of silver. And 30 pieces of silver is not quite a heavy sum as we anticipate. It's, I think, uh, six weeks of six hour, uh, six days a week weeks wages. So what that comes out to be is seven thousand two hundred dollars in today's money, in today's uh, work. So seven grand, these guys are going to give him, so that they could kill Jesus. Now, in all of the workings, church. You can begin to see in the scriptures why Judas did the betraying. We can come up with many scenarios, but in my book, when I read the scriptures, I follow them closely and I see the pattern that Judas was connected to. And what has happened, church, is Judas is in church. Judas is right here in church. And he loves Jesus. Don't get you, don't get it wrong. Judas loves Jesus. Judas figured the guy's gonna die anyway. So why not make a profit off of it? Or the guy's walked out of many situations. Why not? He's gonna get out of this one too. He's not going to die. He's just talking stuff. Who knows the true reasoning, but in my belief, it has to do with this deception that he is in this wrong magnetic field in the body of Christ, in church, and he's lost his true direction. Why? Many reasons. The reasons that I accounted to you earlier, there's a multiple amount of them. As we look at the list, we can see that anger can cause us to lose our magnetic uh, uh, draw to the north. Uh, uh, anger can blind you, church. Amen. Jealousy. Jealousy can cause us to begin to be embittered. And we have a root that begins to come up 
from the ground into our leg, into our heart, and cause us to be embittered because of jealousy. And this jealousy is something that you're not meaning to make it begin to put you in that magnetic field, but it is. Along with that comes the greed of money. Your greediness can move you down the wrong path. What's greediness? Work. Many times we'll start to work, we'll make extra money, we're doing well. We like the fact that we can now buy this and buy that and purchase this and purchase that. And what it does is it begins to blind us that who your true source really is. It's the true north. But we've gotten into this magnetic field and decided, you know what? I'll work Sunday. There has to be some principle in you that says, no, I won't. I remember working for the city of North Glen. I was uh, there. Uh, uh, I was the guy that was in charge of all the metering systems in the city. And being that guy, I had, uh, there were a lot of rules that were put down. I had to uh, uh, go to school to weld. I had to do all kinds of stuff. And guess when welding was? Sunday. Wednesday nights. What? Wednesday nights? So what's the big deal about? Well, Wednesday nights, I go to church. I told my boss, I said, you know what, boss? You've got to find another day for me because I won't go on Wednesday. What do you mean you won't go? I'm your boss. I'm telling you to go. I said, sorry, it's when I go to church. I don't care. You got to you got to figure something out. I said, fire me. I'm not going on Wednesday nights because it's too important to me. I made a principal call and I was valuable enough that he, he fixed it so that I could go at a different time. That's fine. Then as we go further on, you can see where you're getting challenged. Then come Sundays. Sometimes I had absolutely no choice. I had to because I was on call. And being on call meant that you went when they called you. That was a part of your responsibility. I signed a paper at the beginning of my job that said, yes, I will. So I had to obligate to what I signed. But nonetheless, principle, church, is key to your victory in family unity. Principle, what's that in your family? It's that you're willing to do what's right for your kids. And if you need to start working out, work out at an earlier time in the morning. If you need to start praying and you're not, Start praying early in the morning or late at night or work out late at night. But you have to sacrifice so that you can take care of the nuclear family, the nucleus of that family. So that your time and your objective is to do first the work and will of Christ and second, keep together my family and show them this is how dad lives, son. This is how your daddy is. Your daddy's a hard worker. Your daddy's this, your daddy's that. And you're not even telling them that. They're just seeing it. Church, that's key. So then you go further on as we look at the scriptures and all that God's talking about. It says in verse 14 of our text, then one of the 12 called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest, said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? They counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. So from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Now, on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? Then he does the Last Supper. And guess who's in there with him? And he knows that he's betraying him. Judas. At the end, they said, well, which one of us is it? Is it I, Lord? All 12 of the disciples went to Jesus, and they had what they called a reclining system at that time. The seats were just 
on the ground and they had pads along the seat and each of them would be a around this rectangular table and they would lean on each other and rest with their elbows to eat and they would get their food that way and they would eat with their hands. So with this way and reasoning behind it, Jesus tells them, hey, the guy that's going to uh, dip his bread in the soup, he's the one. And they, they have no thought, they kind of lost focus of what Jesus really was saying. And at that time, when Judas dips his soap, and Jesus dips, dips his soap up, they go ahead and they both pull it out and they eat it. And it was Judas. But they didn't know it, didn't see it. Then Judas turns to Jesus and said, oh Lord, I've got to go take care of some business. And Jesus tells him, he said, go do what you have to do. After he leaves, he says to the disciples, woe to the man that betrays the Son of Man. For great perdition is about to fall upon him. In other words, church, today he's regretting and screaming out, I'm sorry, Jesus. I'm sorry I betrayed you. He sits in hell right now. There is no salvation for Judas church. None. Because Jesus said he'd be in hell. Jesus made the comment, not Judas, not any scholar, not to anyone that wrote the, the Bible, but Jesus. With all of this going on, and we see vengeance comes next. That's an evil action that we sometimes want to get back at each other. Just like Jacob with his brother Esau. Esau wanted to come back at him. That's why Jacob was there with his uncle Laban. Then forgiveness and communicate. You could go on and on and read the list and see that what happens is we can get distorted in our view, our need, our want, our love for one another. Mess the whole family up and go the way of the world. The world is trying to draw you and trying to get you to distort the way you live with your family. But you know what? I'm here to tell you, family and friends are the most important next to Christ. You need to know that, church. Need to learn that if you're contemplating something right now, you're thinking about sin, you're thinking about adultery, you're thinking about uh, 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 leaving, you're thinking about uh, whatever it is, don't do it. Whatever is contemplated in your heart and mind, after you leave this place and there's a temptation of the magnetic pull on your life, detect what it, what, what it is and know that it's the wrong magnet and wrong compass and you've got to get to the true north. That's why church is so important. I encourage you, church. I encourage you to start coming as much as you can. The days are darkening and the time is coming to an end. And we must be aware and ready as a body of people and do the will and work of Christ. I want you to bow your heads for a moment as we close this morning. And I understand where you're at and, and know that you're in a difficult position sometimes and what God wants to do is he wants to help you. He wants to encourage and bless you. He wants to walk you through all these difficulties that you face in your life. Jesus loves you, church. And Jesus wants to heal you and he wants to restore you and he wants to bless and encourage you. Would you open your heart this morning and receive him as your Lord and Savior. And would you open your heart this morning and know that family is so important that you have to understand that it's time to forgive. Even past family, step family, family that is no longer in your life, if you have bitterness, if you have anger, if you have any of those things that I've listed earlier in your life, I want you to let them go. Let all this stuff go and do what God wants you to do. 
and that is serve him. Open your heart this morning, church, and let God restore you. This morning, maybe you don't know Christ, or you know him, and you've lost touch with him, or you're backslidden, and you're back here, and you're willing to open your spirit and your heart to him. If that's you this morning, you want to get saved, why don't you raise your hand and say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Christ. Just raise it up and down, yes. Well, there are yes, or there are others. Just raise your hand up and down. I'm not going to ask you to come up here. I'm going to pray with you where you're at. And I want you to open your heart. Amen. Christian, persons that have heard what has been uh, uh, taught this morning, would you understand and open your heart to the family? And would you begin to change all of those roots that are in your life that they would be removed and destroyed. You have a root of bitterness, a root of anger, a root of violence, a root of alcoholism, a root of uh, whatever it may be, lying, stealing, whatever those roots are. And I want to pray for you this morning, and I want you to pray with me about those roots. If that's you, raise your hand. Pastor, I've got roots, man. I've got things that I can't get rid of. There's habits I have. There's issues that are in me. And I need to be free of it. I'm tired of living the life I've lived. Now, if that's you, and, and you want to trust that God's going to set you free, if you can come up here, I want to lay my hands on you, and I want to pray for you. And if you've uh, raised your hand for salvation, come up as well. So if you raise your hand at all, I want you to come up that I can pray for you. Even if you did not raise your hand and you need prayer, you just need someone to lay hands on you, I encourage you to come up. We're going to believe for God to begin to change this situation. Amen.